So you know how I always say I'm gonna read we're gonna read a book and it's one of my all-time favorites. Well, we're gonna read a book and it's one of my all-time favorites. I do love, love, love this book. I don't know how many years I've read it. Um, it feels like forever. Um, but I think you're gonna love it. I always read it during Black History Month because um, I like the fact that it gives us some history um, of our African-American friends in our country, even though I don't necessarily like what that history is. Um, but I think it's important that we know what it is so we don't repeat it. Um, I love that it has strong African-American characters. I love that uh, it's funny and it's sad and it's informative and it's all the things it might very well be the best first chapter of any book out there you're gonna love it today we're gonna start reading the watsons go to birmingham by christopher paul curtis this um is actually was actually christopher paul curtis's first book um and it did really really well he has written other books but not betty um is another one of his that um has also done really well. Um, there is a movie that goes with the Watsons Go to Birmingham, so I will ask you, as I ask you every time, please don't go watch the movie. More than any other book that we've read, this movie does not go with the book. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've read aloud too much today. This movie doesn't follow the book completely. I want us to be able to talk about those changes because they're important. Um, Please don't watch the movie. I don't ask a lot, but I do ask that. So we're going to read, here's your cover, Christopher Paul Curtis's The Watsons Go to Birmingham. <clears throat> it's actually, the title is actually The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963. That year is important. In the 1960s, um, the United States was in the middle of the civil rights movement, the middle of the beginning of the civil rights movement. Um, and there were some weird laws um, and the way that people were treated was not fair. Um, and it was different depending on where you were and in what, what part of the country you were in. Um, in the South, things were a lot harder for African-American people than they were in the North, but it was still hard in the North too. But you're gonna learn about this family and we're gonna find out some things that they find out about our country. I hope that you listened to yesterday's read aloud, Ruth and the Green Book, because it's an excellent tie-in for this particular book. Here we go. I do wanna read that part. This is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents either are the product of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. So what that means is there are some things that were, this book is a work of fiction. The Watson's not a real fa family. It may be based on a real family. Some of the things that happen in the book definitely happened in this country, um, but this story in itself is fiction, so it's made up. Um this book is written in dedication to the author's parents, um, but I want you to notice there also is an in memory of page. And pay attention to this in memory of page. It's in memory of four girls. Addie Mae Collins, who was born 4-1849 and died 9-1563. So she's 14. Denise McNair was born 11 17 51 and died 9 15 63. Carol Robertson was born 4 24 49 and died 9 15 63. Cynthia Wesley was born 4 30 49 and died 9 15 63. And he ends the memoriam by saying, this was the toll for one day in one city. So while this story is fic fiction, the deaths of these four girls was very much fact. Chapter one, and you wonder why we get called the Weird Watsons. 
It was one of those super duper cold Saturdays. One of those days that when you breathed out, your breath kind of hung frozen in the air like a hunk of smoke. And you could walk along and look exactly like a train blowing out big, fat, white puffs of smoke. It was so cold that if you were stupid enough to go outside, your eyes would automatically blink a thousand times all by themselves, probably so the juice inside of them wouldn't freeze up. It was so cold that if you spit, the slob would be an ice cube before it hit the ground. It was about a zillion degrees below zero. It was even cold inside our house. We put sweaters and hats and scarves and three pairs of socks on and still were cold. The thermostat was turned all the way up, and the furnace was banging and sounding like it was about to blow up, but it still felt like Jack Frost had moved in with us. All of my family sat real close together on the couch under a blanket. Dad said this would generate a little heat, but he didn't have to tell us this. It seemed like the cold automatically made us want to get together and huddle up. My little sister Joetta sat in the middle and all you could see were her eyes because she had a scarf wrapped around her head. I was next to her and on the outside was my mother. Mama was the only one who wasn't born in Flint, so the cold was coldest to her. All you could see were her eyes too and they were shooting bad looks at Dad. She always blamed him for bringing her all the way from Alabama to Michigan, a state she called a giant icebox. Dad was bundled up on the other side of Joey, trying to look at anything but Mama. Next to Dad, sitting with a little space between them, was my older brother, Byron. Byron had just turned 13, so he was officially a teenage juvenile delinquent and didn't think it was cool to touch anybody or let anyone touch him, even if it meant he froze to death. Byron had tucked the blanket between him and Dad down into the cushion of the couch, to make sure he couldn't be touched. Dad turned on the TV to try to make us forget how cold we were, but all that did was get him in trouble. There was a special news report on Channel 12 telling about how bad the weather was, and Dad groaned when the guy said, if you think it's cold now, wait until tonight. The temperature is expected to drop into record low territory, possibly reaching the negative 20s. In fact, we won't be seeing anything above zero for the next four to five days. He was smiling when he said this, but none of the Watson family thought it was funny. We all looked over at Dad, and he just shook his head and pulled the blanket over his eyes. Then the guy on the TV said, Here's a little something we can use to brighten our spirits and give us some hope for the future. The temperature in Atlanta, Georgia is forecast to reach... Dad coughed real loud and jumped off the couch to turn the TV off, but we all heard the weatherman say, the mid-70s. That guy might as well have tied Dad to a tree and said, ready, aim, fire. Atlanta, Mama said. That's 150 miles from home. Wilona, Dad said. I knew it, Mama said. I knew I should have listened to Moses Henderson. Who? I asked. Dad said, oh, not that sorry story. You gotta let me tell about what happened with him. Mama said, there's not a whole lot to tell. Just a story about a young girl who made a bad choice. But if you do tell it, make sure you get all the facts right. We all huddled as close as we could because we knew Dad was going to try to make us forget about being cold by cutting up. Me and Joey started smiling right away, and Byron tried to look cool and bored. Kids, Dad said, I almost wasn't your father. You guys came real close to having a clown for a daddy named Hambone Henderson. Daniel Watson, you stop right there. You're the one who started that Hambone nonsense. Before you started that, everyone called him his Christian name, Moses. And he was a respectable boy, too. He wasn't a clown at all. But the name stuck, didn't it? Ham Bone Henderson. Me and your granddaddy called him that because the boy had a head shaped just like a ham bone. Had more knots and bumps on his head than a dinosaur. So as you guys sit here giving me these dirty looks because it's a little chilly outside, ask yourselves if you'd rather be a little cool or go through life being known as the ham bonettes. Me and Joey cracked up. 
Byron kind of chuckled, and Mama put her hand over her mouth. She did this whenever she was going to give a smile, because she had a great big gap between her front teeth. If Mama thought something was funny, first you'd see her trying to keep her lips together to hide the gap. Then if the smile got to be too strong, you'd see the gap for a hot second before Mama's hand would come up to cover it, and then she'd crack up too. Laughing only encouraged Dad to cut up more. So when he saw the whole family thinking he was funny, he really started putting on a show. He stood in front of the TV. Yep, Hambone Henderson proposed to your mother around the same time I did. Fought dirty, too. Told your mama a pack of lies about me. And when she didn't believe them, he told her a pack of lies about Flint. Dad started talking Southern style, imitating this cam Hambone guy. Will Ona. I heard tell about the weather up that far north in Flint, Michigan. Heard it's colder than inside a icebox. Seen a movie about it. Think it was made in Flint. Movie called Nanook of the North. Yep, do believe for sure it was made in Flint. Uh-huh. Flint, Michigan. Those folks up there live in these things called igloos. According to what I seen in this here movie, most of the folks in Flint's Chinese. Don't believe I seen one colored person in the whole dang city. You a Bama gal. Don't believe you'd be too happy living in no igloo. Ain't got nothing against them. But don't believe you'd be too happy living amongst a whole slew of Chinese folks. Don't believe you'd like the food. Only thing them Chinese folks in that movie ate was whales and seals. Don't believe you'd like no male whale meat. Don't taste a lick like chicken. Don't taste like pork at all. Mama pulled her hand away from her mouth. Daniel Watson, you are one lying man. Only thing you said that was true was that being in Flint is like living in an igloo. I knew I should have listened to Moses. Maybe these babies might have been born with lumpy heads, but at least they'd have had warm lumpy heads. You know Birmingham is a good place, and I don't mean just the weather either. The life is slower. The people are friendlier. Oh, yeah, Dad interrupted. They're a laugh a minute down there. Let's see. Where was that colored only bathroom downtown? Now I want to pause. Again, this is taking place in the early 1960s. So at that time, segregation was a huge thing. Um, in the South especially, there were separate water fountains. They would have signs on them that said things like whites only or coloreds only. And the coloreds only referred to African American. It would actually refer to anyone who wasn't white. So if you were African American or Hispanic um, or Chinese, like they were talking about here. If you weren't white, you had to drink from the other water fountain. They had separate restrooms. Um, they had separate entrances. So like if you went to the movies, um, if you were, and they would say colored was the word that they used then to show that you weren't talking about white people. Um, but often anybody that was considered colored at that time would have to go in a rear entrance. They couldn't go in the front of the building. Um, like in yesterday's book, they could get gas at gas stations, but they wouldn't be allowed to go in the store or to um, use the restrooms there. Um, they had separate schools. They had separate doctor's offices. They had separate churches. Um, it was kind of sad. It wasn't just kind of sad. It was a lot of sad. So at this time, she's talking about how great Birmingham is a, as a place to live. And he's bringing up the fact that, sure, it's a fabulous place where we were not allowed to use the bathroom there. But sure, wonderful. So that's what he's referring to. So now let's get back to it. Daniel, you know what I mean. Things aren't perfect, but people are more honest about the way they feel. She took her mean eyes off Dad and put them on Byron. And folks there do know how to respect their parents. Byron rolled his eyes like he didn't care. All he did was tuck the blanket farther into the couch's cushion. Dad didn't like the direction the conversation was going, so he called the landlord for the hundredth time. The phone was still busy. That snake in the grass has got his phone off the hook. Well, it's going to be too cold to stay here tonight. Let me call Sydney. She just had that new furnace put in. Maybe we could spend the night there. Aunt Sydney was kind of mean, but her house was always warm, so we kept our fingers crossed that she was home. Everyone, even Byron, cheered when Dad got Aunt Sydney to tell us to hurry over before we froze to death. Dad went out to try and get the brown bombers started. 
That was what we called our car. It was a 1948 Plymouth that was dull brown and real big. Byron said it was turd brown. Uncle Bud gave it to Dad when it was 13 years old, and we had had it for two years. Me and Dad took real good care of it, but some of the time it didn't like to start up in the winter. After five minutes, Dad came back in, huffing and puffing and slapping his arms across his chest. Well, it was touch and go for a while, but the great brown one pulled through again. Everyone cheered, but me and Byron quit cheering and started frowning right away. By the way Dad smiled at us, we knew what was coming next. Dad pulled two ice scrapers out of his pocket and said, Okay, boys, let's get out there and knock those windows out. We moaned and groaned and put some more coats on and went outside to scrape the car's windows. I could tell by the way he was pouting that Byron was going to try and get out of doing his share of the work. I'm not going to do your part, Byron. You better do it, and I'm not playing either. Shut up, punk. I went over to the brown bomber's passenger side and started hacking away at the scab of ice that was all over the windows. I finished Mama's window and took a break, scraping ice off the windows when it's that cold and kill you. I didn't hear any sound coming from the other side of the car, so I yelled out, I'm serious, Byron. I'm not doing that side, too, and I'm only going to do half the windshield. I don't care what you do to me. The windshield on the bomber wasn't like the new 1963 cars. It had a big bar running down the middle of it, dividing it in half. This would be something like what the brown bomber would look like, but brown, obviously. But here's what he's talking about. See that bar down the middle of the windshield? So he's talking about he's only going to do his half. So that bar was important to him. So he just finished telling Byron he's not doing that side. Um, it had a big bar. The windshield had a big bar running down the middle of it, dividing it in half. Shut your stupid mouth. I got something more important to do right now. I peeked around the back of the car to see what Vi was up to. The only thing he'd scraped off was the outside mirror, and he was bending down to look at himself in it. He saw me and said, You know what, Square? I must be adopted. There just ain't no way two folks as ugly as your mom and daddy could give birth to someone as sharp as me. He was running his hands over his head like he was brushing his hair. I said, forget you, and went back over to the other side of the car to finish the back window. I had half of the ice off when I started, when I, sorry, I had half of the ice off when I had to stop again and catch my breath. I heard Byron mumble my name. You know what's real sad? We have to stop here today. We'll finish this chapter tomorrow.